Hello and welcome to video four of five. I'm Lilia Perez, the Grants and Programs Manager for Arts Mid Hudson. And in this video, I'm going to go over the Individual Artist Commission in depth, and we'll also take a look at the application. So we're gonna go over the scope of the funding and the goals, which will be a bit of a refresher from video number one. We'll go over eligibility, the public component, which is probably where I'll go the most in depth in this video. We'll give some tips about submitting a grant proposal and look at the online application form on Submittable. I'll discuss the peer panel review process and also give some other tips at the end and throughout. If you haven't done so already, please go and watch video number one. I cover a lot of the basics for the program as a whole and give some general tips about how to apply to this program. And of course, please also review the guidelines. Everything I'm going to say in this video and more exists in writing in the guidelines. So first I'll discuss the scope of the funding, what we can and cannot fund through the Individual Artist Commission. The Individual Artist Commission supports one artist in the creation of new work during the funding period, which will be 2021. All projects must engage a segment of the community through a small scale public presentation or community involvement during the creative process. Due to COVID-19, presentations and community involvement may be done in person or virtual. All grant awards are determined by a peer panel review process, and the panel for this Individual Artist Commission is made up entirely of working artists. New for this year, we're going to be able to fund up to seven Individual Artist Commissions per county. Now, before we get into more of the details, I'm going to show some examples of Individual Artist Commissions that we funded previously. He got an Individual Artist Commission to build a bunch of new puppets and put on a production called Dragon Circus, which um, is shown here. Uh, he took them out during a First Friday event in Poughkeepsie. We funded Crystal Yang and her painting series Neo Hudson River Painting. Crystal did an exhibition of the work she created during the funding period and it was you know, a very straightforward way to fulfill the public component while still putting together a really nice show that she was able to share. Julia Whitney Barnes did her project Hudson River of Bricks. She collected bricks from many people all over the region that were made here in the Hudson Valley and then she arranged them in the shape of the Hudson River so it was a large scale installation. She actually did both a public presentation and involvement during the creative process because she was gathering materials for her piece from community members. She also installed the full piece and had an exhibition of it. Jovan O'Neill is a poet from Newburgh and he did his project from Brick Street to the Grave. He wrote a new series of poems and for his public component, he led a workshop at the Newburgh Free Library, which as you can see from these pictures was so well attended and impressive. He led a poetry workshop that was related thematically to the work he was creating for the Individual Artist Commission. Uh, and he actually partnered with an art another artist to present uh, this workshop. Karen Gersh got an Individual Artist Commission for her production, Humanity Tales. This was a really interesting process where Karen, acting as a writer, director, and choreographer, worked with uh, several participants over many sessions. They all shared stories and shared experiences, and Karen compiled all of those and edited them into a production in which all of the participants who helped craft the story of the show acted as actors and dancers. Jing Shui got an individual artist commission for her project Fan Your Talents. She does traditional Chinese fan painting and fan dancing. So while choreographing her own individual dance and painting fans, she also led a series of workshops in New Paltz, teaching community members how to paint on fans and how to choreograph their own dance. So a reminder of the key components of the Individual Artist Commission. The focus is to fund one individual artist in the creation of new work. Again, this does not fund the presentation of existing work or finishing costs on a project that is nearly completed. The funding amount is $1,500 and there is no cash match required. All expressive artistic disciplines are eligible. All projects must include a public component, which can either be presentation of the work created during the period, either in person or virtually, or involvement of a community during the artist's creative process. The goals of the program are to support Duchess Orange and Ulster County artists in the creation of new work, support underrepresented artists in our region, including Black, Latinx, Indigenous, Asian, people of color, LGBTQ+, and disabled artists. All artists are encouraged to apply. Another goal is to highlight the vital role that artists play within a community. These projects present a really great opportunity for the general public to see how an artist work, how they do their craft, and hopefully have a positive impact on the community, either inspiring other people to undertake creative endeavors, or just to help contribute to the culture that's being developed within a community. We also see this grant as a good opportunity to help artists who are trying to adapt to social distancing requirements 
um, and trying to present their work in a completely different way than they have before. I'm going to go over some key eligibility factors. All artists apply directly to the Individual Artist Commission and you can only submit one proposal per individual artist. The artist has to be at least 18 years of age at the time of submission and a resident of Dutchess Orange or Ulster Counties in New York State. They may not be enrolled full-time in a degree program. Groups, collectives, or collaborations are not eligible. It must be one single person. Projects must be independent work initiated by the artist. So this means that this isn't the place for uh, organization to commission an artist to create a piece for their space. These are projects that are initiated by the artist and the artist applies directly to this grant opportunity. Artists who receive the Individual Artist Commission may apply again if their commission took place in 2017 or earlier. So that means the recipients of the past three years are ineligible. Now I'll talk about some projects that are ineligible. So the primary focus must be an arts activity. So projects that are primarily recreational, therapeutic, rehabilitative, or religious will not be eligible for funding. The grant funds cannot be used for fundraising events, humanities programs, or academic programs. An artist might do a workshop as part of their individual artist commission to do the public component. But um, when we say that this can't be something that's primarily academic, that means that we couldn't fund like an artist developing a uh, lesson plan or something like that as the entire project. We cannot fund martial arts, stand-up comedy, recreational parades, balloons, clowns, magic, or sip and paint events. We cannot fund projects that result in permanent public art, which includes permanent murals or permanent sculpture. This is because we cannot fund anything that is a capital improvement to building or land. So if the mural is permanent or if the sculpture is permanent, it is not eligible for funding. And then again, a reminder, this is not the place for a community arts grant applicant to apply for artist fees. Next, we'll talk about allowable expenses. So these are the things that you will most likely be putting on your budget as things that the grant funds are going to be paying for. First of all, artist fee to the individual artist. We get this question all the time. And yes, you are allowed to pay yourself for the work that you're going to be doing as a part of the individual grant. It is up to you. You can allot the entire grant to the artist fee or you can put a portion towards the artist fee. You may also have costs associated with the public component. These might include transportation costs, marketing expenses, printing costs, or space rental. You can also use the funding for supplies and materials needed to execute the proposed project. So these are things like art supplies, hardware, memory cards, and other consumable equipment. New this year, you can request that some of the funds go towards equipment, software, subscriptions, and training needed to execute the proposed project. All of these things should be really directly related to what you're trying to do. Individual items for equipment, software, subscriptions, and supplies and materials may not exceed $1,000. Next, I'll go over non-fundable expenses. These are expenses that should not appear as line items on your budget that you are asking us to pay for. I'll skim through them quickly because they are all listed within our guidelines. First, we cannot fund operating expenses of privately owned facilities. These include homes and studios. And we cannot fund capital improvements to buildings or land. This is not meant to fund the acquisition of works of art, the creation of textbook or classroom materials. The funding may not go towards contingency funds, lobbying expenses, or regrants by the applicant to fund other activities. Awards, trophy certificates, stipends, cash prizes, juror fees, contest fellowships. We can't fund any of these things with this funding. We cannot fund fees paid to children under the age of 18 or entertainment costs, including receptions, food, and fundraising events. Uh, we also cannot fund out-of-state travel. The only transportation that we can fund has to be within New York State. All right, so next we'll talk about the public component in depth. So as I said a few times now, in addition to creating the new work, the individual artists also must include a public component in their project. The main focus of this funding is to fund the creation of new work. Artists are only required to select one of the following options, either the public presentation or community involvement during the creative process. The grant amount this year has been reduced to $1,500, so we fully expect the scope of the public presentations and community involvement to reduce as well. If you are choosing to do a public presentation, it must be open to the general public and it can be in-person or virtual. In-person presentations must take place in the artist's county of residence. If it's virtual, then of course you don't have to worry about that. Artists may charge an admission fee for public presentations, and again, it should not be a large-scale or expensive final presentation. That's really not the purpose of this grant. If you're planning to do a presentation of the work on a much larger scale, you might want to think about pulling in some external grant funds or sponsorships 
because the $1,500 grant is not going to be enough to cover the creation of the work and a large scale production or presentation. All public presentations that are in person must comply with New York State guidance and laws related to COVID-19. And jumping back, when we say that these can be a public presentation or an, and they can be in person or virtual, there's so many different things that you can do. Uh, if it's in person, it could be a small scale exhibition, it could be a stage reading of a play or a small reading of poetry or writing that is done as a result of the individual artist commission. A lot of artists have set up booths at farmers markets or other festivals in order to show the work they've created in a different kind of way than they usually do and draw in a new audience for their work. Virtual presentations can be anything from having a uh, online streamed presentation of the work you create that's live or recorded. It could be a virtual exhibition. It could be posting the images on your social media or your website. We're very happy to be able to accept more low budget ways of presenting the work to the public and fulfilling this component. This again is a proposal. So it's a proposal of what you plan to do. As we have all learned in 2020, plans can change very quickly. So we fully anticipate that the public component plan that you lay out in your proposal can change and often does change. We just want to see that there's sufficient planning in place that you have come up with a preliminary plan to at least get started. And if that changes along the way, if you find a different way to present that makes more sense based on the work that ends up happening, that's perfectly fine. At Artsman Hudson, we strive towards broad inclusion and true access to arts and cultural programming for all. So for these reasons, we ask all of our grantees to do thoughtful outreach to many groups in our region when they're putting out public programming and to do specific outreach efforts to underserved audiences. These are groups that may have limited access to arts and cultural programming or services due to their location, race, economic status, gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, age, religion, disability, or other factors. For the Individual Artist Commission, you're likely going to be doing a very small scale public program, uh, either during the creation of the work or as a final presentation. So for example, if you say you wanna reach out to the Spanish speaking community in a specific town in the Hudson Valley, that should be backed up by planning like how you're going to translate materials, where you're going to post materials. If you already have connections or are part of that community yourself, show us that you have a thoughtful plan to reach out to that group so that it doesn't read as something that's just being thrown into the application without a plan to back it up to actually see it through. Now the second option, again, you do not need to do both of these things. You do not need to do a public presentation and involvement during the creative process. So now let's go over involvement during the creative process. This is when an artist works with a specific community during the creative process and involves them in some way. So based on the content of the project, select a very specific community that aligns with what you're trying to do. If you're going to be leading a workshop in a specific town, then that community will be that town. You know, So I, I rarely recommend saying that your community is everyone or the Hudson Valley. That's just a little too broad for the scope of this project. Some examples of involving a community during the creative process might be directly involving community members during the creation of the work, so actually community members having a hand in the physical creation of the pieces. It could be involving community members in the creation of the work via workshops or having community members act as performers or community members might make work alongside the artist that's then shown together. There are really so many options on how to do this. Another option is conducting interviews or gathering stories and anecdotes from a specific community and then using that information as content for the work that you're creating. Of course, all community involvement may be done virtually. So if you're going to conduct meetings via Zoom or use social media in some way to engage a specific community, that is allowable. If you would like to go this route and you're struggling to come up with a plan that you think fits the work that you're trying to create, let's talk about it, make an appointment and we can brainstorm and then take a look back at some of the examples I gave earlier in the video. And now a note on accessibility for the public component in general. Priority will be given to activities that take place in locations that are fully compliant with the American Disabilities Act. You can go to the ADA hotline listed here or ada.gov for more information. This really applies to in-person events associated with your project. If you already know what that location will be, please make sure that it is ADA compliant. We encourage you to think about accessibility broadly 
you may consider securing resources for blind individuals or resources for individuals who are deaf or hard of hearing. And then also considering if a program is in person or virtual and the effect that will have on those that can engage. If we're doing something in person, it excludes people who have pre-existing conditions or just do not feel comfortable going out into a public or indoor space. Virtual programming also excludes a lot of people. It excludes people who don't have reliable access to the internet or technology needed to access the internet. It's a very difficult time for an individual to meet all of these needs. But I bring it up just so that you consider that uh, and, and how that aligns with the goals of what you're trying to do with your project. Consider if, whether you're going in person or virtual, what effect that's going to have on your audience and if that makes sense for the content of your project. All right, so those were all the specifics about the Individual Artist Commission. And now we're going to jump and take a look at the outline application and I'll provide some tips about how to submit a competitive grant proposal. Again, the deadline is Wednesday, October 28th of this year. The form will close just before midnight at 11.59 p.m. And we take all grant proposals on our online platform Submittable, and you can find it at artsmithudson.submittable.com or on our website, artsmithudson.org. If you require any assistance in completing the online submission form, please contact us and do so in advance of the deadline if possible so that we can give you adequate assistance. So now I'll go ahead and jump to our website and show you where to find our online grant proposal form. Okay, so you'll go to our website, which is artsmithudson.org, and right on the home page, there is this button, 2021 Decentralization Grants. Go ahead and click there, and this will bring you to all the information for the Individual Artist Commission and for the Community Arts Grant. You can click here to sign up for emails about the program, download the Individual Artist Commission guidelines right here, and complete the proposal eligibility form, which is again a short form where you give us some key details about your project, and then I will go through and read all of those submissions and check for eligibility and provide some feedback on things you might wanna pay attention to while you're crafting your proposal. I'm gonna jump down here. This is where you'll find some information about the three categories, and then this is some other additional resources that you'll need to complete your proposal. So you'll find the link to attend a Zoom Q&A session right here, sign up for the RSVP, and you will get the Zoom access information before every meeting. Before I expand this one, I'm gonna show you quickly the other uh, grant assistance resources. So here's another link to the proposal eligibility form and a link to make an appointment with me to either discuss your ideas, brainstorm, or receive feedback on a draft or budget. And then down here, there's some more information about our review procedure and the link to nominate a peer panelist to serve on one of our peer review panels. Under how to submit a grant proposal, this is where you'll find links to the uh, budget form and to the submission form. So I'm gonna click here and that will take us to the submission form on Submittable. Once you come to this page, you'll see some key information about the grant, some links to download, some of the stuff that was listed online, and then it will ask you to log in or create an account. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead and log in now. You create an account because that is how you save your draft and then you don't have to work on it all at once. You will not be able to see the full application form until you have created an account. So the first half of the submission form is all of your contact information. So please provide your name. Uh, if you have another name that you use for promotion, please put it here. Otherwise, we will use your legal name when we announce who receives the grants. Please provide your pronouns here. If you do not wish to provide your pronouns, then we will use they, them during the review process. Other contact information and uh, information about your location. Here, we'll ask you to briefly describe yourself as an artist, your artwork, and your creative practice. This is your artist statement or your bio or a combination of the two. I always recommend to artists, go ahead and work with some of that text that you probably already have floating around in various artist statements or bios that you've used for things and try to craft something that really highlights all of the components that are most relevant to the project you are proposing to us now. Then once we have the information about you, we'll ask for some information about the project. So you'll give it a project title and a one sentence summary. We really use these for internal purposes to keep track of which grant submission is which. You'll provide a start date and an end date. Here we'll ask you for your total project expenses. The grant amount is $1,500. So if there is no additional income, coming into the project, then just please write 1500 here. The next question, describe the project and the artistic work that you will create. Provide specifics so that the review panel can understand the full scope of the project and what you're trying to do. So this will include what the work is that you're going to create and your description of the project as a whole. Next, we're going to ask you to describe the public component of the project. 
So again, you're either selecting a public presentation or community involvement, and you'll describe the scope of that public component here. So really these two questions go hand in hand uh, because together they're going to show the full scope of what you are asking us to fund and what the project is. So you'll probably work on these closely together. Here, please provide an estimate of how many people will participate in the project. Of course, you do not know the exact number of people that will participate. We have to record this information for uh, NISCA regrant purposes, so please provide your very best estimate. You'll provide a timeline here. Depending on what's relevant to the project, you can either use specific dates or talk about the month in general. And then the next question is explain how this project will help develop your career as an artist. This is really important to the Individual Artist Commission. We see this grant as an opportunity for artists to expand their practice in some way. So highlight any ways that this work is breaking new ground for you, allowing you to work in a new medium, allowing you to reach out and engage with a new audience. All of those things are going to be really good bonuses to your project. The Save Draft button is all the way at the bottom of the application. And we have these reminders scattered throughout uh, so that uh, you know to scroll down and press save. It does auto save so I think you'll be okay if you don't remember to press it all the time and just please don't X out of the page before you press save. Always make sure you scroll down and press save before you're Xing out. Next it's going to ask you for some information that really is all just stuff that we have to record for NISCA regrant purposes. It will have very little effect on the review of your grant proposal. Please just select whichever applies best to your project. This number trips people up to the number of youth under 19 who are participating. Again, this is just your very best estimate. It will not have a major effect on the review of your grant proposal. We get questions about NISCA descriptor codes all the time. Again, this really has little effect on your grant proposal. Just select whichever you believe best apply. Uh, many will select none of the above here. And so then we're already into the attachments. Here is where you will upload your budget form. I will have the next video going in depth on the budget, so I'm not gonna talk about it too much here. Next, you're uploading your resume or bio. We ask for a limit of two pages on this resume or bio. Next is the proof of residency upload. There is a short description of the allowable proof of residencies here, which include a telephone bill, credit card, or bank statement. Please block off your social security number or other financial information that is uh, personal. All proof of residencies must include the name, address and can be dated no earlier than 2020. So for example, if your driver's license was issued uh, several years ago, then I recommend finding a bill or a credit card or bank statement, something that has 2020 on it. Next, this is where you will upload your work samples. Please upload up to 10 files. There is no limit on the file size, but we recommend that JPEG or PDF files not exceed five. MB and audio video files not exceed 10 MB. I always recommend the smaller file size the better without harming the quality of the work. All the acceptable file types are listed here and they're also listed within the guidelines. Uh, just a general note here, I recommend doing all of these attachments as quickly as possible just to make sure that the form is accepting all of your files. Uh, if you are having trouble, just reach out and we'll figure out a way to get uploaded to the form. And then here is a space to upload any other additional supplemental materials. These could be letters of recommendation, mock-up flyers or promotional materials, or other video documentation of the artist or your practice. Please label all file names very clearly uh, and include the applicant name in the title. And then there's a space here if you have any notes on your attachments. If you want to describe what an image is, you can do so here. Please make sure you thoroughly read the certification and then sign. There are a couple very quick survey questions at the end, and then you'll click submit. So that was the grant proposal submission form. I wanna go over a couple quick grant writing tips to help you in crafting your proposal. So the first is to answer questions directly and succinctly. Keep in mind that the individuals who will be reviewing your grant proposals will be reading a lot of grant proposals. So you wanna be as straightforward and to the point as you possibly can. Uh, make sure that you are very clearly saying what the funding will be spent on, how this will advance your career as an artist, and that the key components of the project are laid out in a way that is very easy to digest and understand. Provide specifics to understand the scope of the project throughout 
and always be demonstrating the depth of your planning. When you're writing your grant proposal, you want to write for someone who knows nothing about you or the project. It's really important to not make assumptions and make sure the who, what, when, where, and why of the project all exist in writing within the grant proposal. Of course, there may be somebody on the panel who is familiar with you or your work, but you do not want to depend on that. You want to make sure that any key terms or key components of the project are very clearly explained within the grant proposal. Reference the goals and priorities of the funding program. Refer to the guidelines. That shows that you read the materials associated with the grant, that you're aware of what the grant is trying to achieve, and that you are aligning your project to those goals as well. Control the review discussion. This really means to make sure that there are no distractions within your grant proposal. A distraction could be omitting a key piece of information. So for example, if you never tell us uh, what exactly you're going to be creating, the panel is going to spend time uh, reading the proposal back during the meeting again, uh, trying to understand what the answer to that question is, and that's precious time away from them discussing the really good parts of your proposal. So again, this is why it's always a really good idea to have an outside person read your proposal. I'm gonna quickly go over the peer panel review process. All submitted grant proposals will be reviewed using a peer panel evaluation process. We do not withhold any grant proposals from that review process. Everything goes to panel. So I'm gonna quickly go over the peer panel review process. So all proposals that are submitted to the Individual Artist Commission are reviewed by the peer panel. We do not withhold any grant proposals from the panel process. The panel is made up entirely of artists who evaluate the grant proposals and select which artists will receive funding. There are new and returning panelists every year. Artsmith Hudson staff and board do not have a vote in this process. Uh, myself and our executive director are present during the panel meeting. We have a voice during the discussion, but we do not have a vote. The review panel will read all of the applications independently before the panel meeting, and then during the panel meeting, we will have a discussion about each grant proposal. They will be reviewing based on the following criteria, artistic merit, project feasibility, and the impact of the project. There is a full description of all of these review areas in the guidelines, so I really encourage you to go and take a look at that. These are really critical to think about while you're writing your grant proposal because these are the things that the review panel will actually be scoring on. So if you are asking somebody to read or review your grant proposal before you submit it to us, it might be a good idea to ask them to consider these three areas of uh, review. The first one, artistic merit, is mainly scored based on the work samples that you submit of your previous work. We often get a question about what work an artist should submit when they are making a proposal for work that they haven't created yet. From your body of existing work, select what is most relevant to what you are trying to do. That might be connected thematically to the work that you're going to be creating through the Individual Artist Commission or a similar or the same medium. When the review panel is scoring for artistic merit, they will look at the quality of the work sample submitted. They will also be looking at the description of what work you plan to create. For the next criteria, project feasibility, they're looking at if the budget makes sense, does the timeline make sense, is there sufficient planning in place to execute the project? And generally, does it appear that the applicant will be able to complete the project close to what's being described in the proposal? For impact of the project, they'll be considering the impact on the individual artist, if it will help develop their career in any way. They'll also be thinking about the public component, and then does it address one or more of the goals for 2021 funding? Getting towards the end here, so I'm just going to provide some last tips and some final reminders. A good next step from here would be to go and review the online application form and just look over the guidelines again to make sure that you're very clear on what we can and cannot fund. Complete the project eligibility form and provide some quick information so that I can let you know if your project is eligible and provide feedback on how you can craft a strong proposal. When you're looking at the online application form, take a close look at all of those attachments that will be required, and I recommend starting to work on those right away and make sure they are in order well before the deadline. And then, of course, at any time, make an appointment with me so that we can talk about your questions, brainstorm ideas, or go over a draft of your proposal. Now some final reminders. The deadline, again, Wednesday, October 28th of this year. The online submission form will close at midnight. The deadline for the proposal eligibility form is October 14th of this year. You can attend a Q&A session on Zoom. The schedule and RSVP form is linked here, and you can also find it on our website. If you would like to make a one-on-one -on -one appointment with me to discuss your proposal and your ideas, you can do so at artsmithudson.youcanbook.me, and it's also linked on our website. 
So that's going to be it for this video. Thank you so much for your interest and for listening to all of this information about this grant opportunity. I hope that you found it helpful. And if you have any questions at all, my contact information is listed here. You can email me at grants at artsmithudson.org or give me a call at the phone number uh, listed below. My extension is 11. My name is Lilia Perez. I'm the Grants and Programs Manager for Arts Mid Hudson, and I hope to see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.